Welcome back to the study day, Armory Schaefer's Ecologies of Music and Sound Reexamined. Uh, we had such a rich morning and I know we're going to have a very good conversations this afternoon. Because we've got some new folks in the room uh, and because it is so important, I want to reiterate perhaps a slightly shorter version of the land acknowledgement that I gave this morning. You know, the basic details are on this slide, but they don't capture uh, the essence of why we need to offer a land acknowledgement and what it is we're doing when we when we do that. We're gathering here from many places and contexts with different obligations. I'm a white cisgender, reasonably abled settler Canadian with a secure job. And I meet with you today and offer this land acknowledgement from my position of privilege and responsibility. I grew up in a climate of racism on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and Dakota peoples in Territory One, Treaty One territory in Manitoba. And I currently live and work in Ottawa, Canada as a guest on unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. We're meeting on a platform, Zoom, on a network, the internet, that assumes we have the privilege and agency to access it. Recognizing our privilege and committing to work for a more equitable society is a responsibility and an ever renewing commitment. And today is a stark reminder of that responsibility. September 30th is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation in Canada. It recognizes the dark legacy of 150 years of Indian residential schools and of the resulting intergenerational trauma. We honor the survivors and mourn the deaths of children who never returned home. We work towards doing a better job to complete the 94 actions recommended by the TRC report in 2015, only 11 of which have yet been completed. And I want to say again that some of the words and actions of Armory Schaefer were harmful and are still capable of causing pain to Indigenous people. Schaefer freely appropriated from global cultures past and present, including Indigenous cultures. In some of his work, Schaefer mimicked Indigenous stories, borrowed from Indigenous languages, used Indigenous symbols, and in at least one documented case, he appropriated a Blackfoot chant without attribution. In this, he was not alone among 20th century Canadian composers, and this afternoon, Jeremy Strawn will tell us about the Indigenous-led Accountability for Change Council, a reparative initiative at the Canadian Music Centre that is initiating tough conversations about how we are to approach this history of national identification through cultural appropriation. So before we get going again, I want to once again acknowledge the artistic climate of Indigenous resurgence in Canada, the incredible flowering of creativity and creative response to this very important issue. And I want again to read out the names of just a few of the influential creative Indigenous music and sound artists working in Canada today. Barbara Asiganak, Andrew Balfour, Leanne Betasamosaki Simpson, Ian Cusson, Chris Dirksen, Jeremy Dutcher, Geronimo Inutik, Marion Newman, Melody McIver, Corey Payette, Dylan Robinson, Olivia Short, Tanya Tagak, Christine Tutu, Lakuluk Williamson Bathory, Jason Young. The list could be much, much longer than this. Once again, I welcome you all, and uh, we're going to get going with our first session this afternoon. Um, the title of our session is Thinking Sound Embodiments, and we've got some, uh, some really great presenters with us. Dylan Robinson and Michael Nardone are going to present together, and Mickey Valley is also going to present. Hello, Michael and Dylan. Hello, Mickey. Can you um, unmute and just let's have a couple of voices actually saying hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Okay, it's so good to, to have you here. And the, and the way that we're going to proceed is we'll have both talks and then we'll have generous time for discussion afterwards. Okay, 
So uh, Mickey, I'm just going to mute you so there's no uh, um, extraneous sound. And I think Michael and Dylan, you said you weren't going to share a screen or but you are certainly able to do so if you want to go ahead. We will. We will actually share a screen. Sorry. Yes. yes. No, no, no. You, you, you did tell me that. You revised that. I And, and uh, of course, Michael wrote to me. Pardon me. Uh, how can you tell it's afternoon and not morning? <laughs> no worries. No worries. Uh, so maybe we might start by just introducing ourselves. So, a swale to ilo tal squeak to litsal quat squa, castash alats, chitsulatsul to humach quem chromaki equala. Um, uh, just very briefly there, I said uh, who I was. My name is Dylan Robinson. I am a uh, Stalo squaw, squaw band from this area, just outside of this area, close to Chilliwack, what is now called Chilliwack or Chilliwick from um, outside of Vancouver. Uh, and I am coming to you today from Khmachquim lands at the University of British Columbia. We are we are coming to you from this from this place. Um, and I just uh, you know thanked thanked my down downriver relatives here, Khmachquim, and also extended a uh, welcome to those uh, those folks whose lands were all coming together, you know, through the wires, as Ellen said, uh, those those different um, Indigenous folks and, and lands uh, where you are all situated. I wanted to thank you, Ellen, for for your acknowledgement. And I, I just I felt like I should say a few words along those lines as well. Of course, today is the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation and uh, many Indigenous folks prioritizing our families uh, and communities in the work that needs to be done. Um, you know, and and prioritizing a, a range of of different things. I mean, everyone, everything, one I think treats this this work very very differently. And so, for me, part of that is addressing head on some of the challenges um, that uh, that we face as Indigenous scholars and and um, you know musicians practitioners with the legacy of our Murray Schaefer. Um, mm -hmm. But I thought I might also say that interestingly, and I think Ellen, you pointed this out to me a, a long time ago, that I am very much a product of the legacy of Armory Schaefer in the sense that, uh, you know, my my formative years at university, at Simon Fraser University, uh, within the contemporary arts program and interdisciplinary arts practice really, I think, you know, um, came out of that legacy and others, others joined to that legacy. So the you know, in a, in, a, in a strange way, the environment there at the time when I was a long time ago now, but at, at Simon Fraser University, not as long as when Armory Schaefer was there, obviously, but when I was there, that interdisciplinary ethos and, and cross artistic collaboration was was still so strong and present and has really resulted in the kind of scholar and, and arts practitioner that I am. Hmm. Um, so, so that was one thing I wanted to say, and just then very briefly also, um, that there that there is a lot, and Jeremy Strawn will be referring to this later in the presentation. There's a lot of um, necessary critique um, that you know needs to be made public of uh, of Schaefer's works and practices. And uh, you know, I've been having these discussions now with the Indigenous Advisory Council. Um, for a while. And so I hope there is really a, um, a future moment for Indigenous folks to come together in a public format and and really, you know, talk about these these difficult relationships that a lot of us have to Schaefer's legacy. Um, but yes, but that will be that won't be part of what we're talking about today. And maybe I'll turn it over to Michael. Sorry, I've said a lot there, but uh, I'll just give a very, very quick introduction. Uh, my name is Michael Nardone. I'm a settler scholar uh, living in Jojage, Montreal. Um, I uh, come to Montreal through a number of years living uh, in and around Den and Day, uh, around Yellowknife, outside of Yellowknife, uh, up into the Satu, a place called Radilico, Fort Good Hope. Um, uh, I am a uh, independent uh, writer, editor, and researcher um, uh, who uh, works across poetics, uh, media studies, uh, sound and performance. And uh, I've been intrigued by Dylan's work for years. Uh, and um, uh, you're catching us uh, in this moment of, of uh, essentially trying to figure out a, a, a collaboration of which we are in the process of figuring it out. Yeah. 
yeah. and 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 we, on that note, maybe it will just say that uh, um, originally Dylan was asked to take part uh, in this conference and thought this might be a, a nice way to to articulate some initial development in what we've been doing in this kind of writing residency over these last few days. Uh, and um, originally, I thought that thinking about Schaefer would be a kind of detour and that we wouldn't, uh, you know, we would kind of throw in something that we were thinking about towards the direction of Schaefer. But uh, uh, independently, just before Dylan and I <laughs> met here, we both uh, without communicating this to one another, I'm quite sure, yeah, yeah. We, we both, uh, through the SFU uh, World Sound Project, uh, Soundscape Project, uh, um, uh, came upon this document called the Vancouver Soundscape that was originally published in 1973. I'm trying to share a screen right now, but for some reason it keeps, uh, it keeps, it keeps. Try like, again. Oh, Microsoft PowerPoint, share. Open system preferences. Have another go at it. I just made change to setting. Yeah. Uh, um. You know what? It it's 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 possibly. Oh, it would be nice to share the screen though, eh? Because we. I, I mean, if you want to, yeah. I can. I can. I've just it. made. I've just made you a host, Michael. Try try that again. I. Oh, it's 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 on my local situation of uh, wanting to. Open up system preferences. Oh my For what reason? No, let's just do this. Let's just um, do this. Yeah. So maybe I'll I'll just say a little bit. You know, I I first encountered this um, book, or you've been calling it a, a pamphlet, Vancouver Soundscape, when I was at SFU, and kind of flipped through it, and you know, as an undergraduate student, found it really interesting and in focusing on the sound of of this of this place, you know, Vancouver, the, the colonial name that we call Vancouver, or Stalo folks we call Alitz, um, which translates to, I think this is really important, it, it translates to wide at bottom, because we, our orientation as upriver folks um, to Vancouver is where things open up. Mm. And so our, even you know, this kind of sense of directionality or what Vancouver is to us is, is you know, oriented uh, in that upriver, downriver relationship relationship um so yeah hadn't hadn't actually returned to this document in whatever that is 20 more plus years and uh and found it really interesting coming back to it the way that um Schaefer was orchestrating voices at the beginning of the document and the the design of the document and uh, really thought it would be a useful way for us to begin reconsidering what we were here to do in the first place which was think about listening in this place now called Vancouver Alitz um uh to us from a settler colonial and indigenous perspective what is this what is resurgent what's resurgent listening practice um you know through through this place what is how do we hear settler the kind of settler colonial uh, infrastructure and, and development of this place um and so when we came across this document for me at least i was i was really um you know I was I was curious and uh, frustrated and all of those kind of things that make you want to dig into what is what is this thing, um, yeah. this this document specifically. So we're going to start there, and I, maybe you want to say a few things about. Yeah. So so as Dylan just said, it's 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 a fascinating, troubling document, uh, and and as we've been talking and imagining this sort of collaboration, uh, it one of the things. Uh, we've felt intrigued by is to to kind of respond to it in a certain kind of way. And so just overview, it's published in 1973. Can can, can somebody just uh, say that they can see it? Is the share screen? Yeah, working? Yeah, yes, we can see it. Thanks. Yeah, lovely. Sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, the fifth document from the, the World Soundscape Project that they publish. Uh, it's the, whereas the first four are kind of overview, kind of general practices around listening. This fifth one is the first, the quote unquote, first field study of an actual environment. Uh, and um, uh, it's, uh, it's, 
it provides a series of ear witness accounts, which we'll talk about in a second, a uh, kind of overview. Uh, and then it does this kind of analysis of the Vancouver landscape in that you, you have uh, Schaefer, you know, uh, really working through some of the central ideas that will co come, he'll publish in in uh, Tuning of the World in 1977, four years later, but this is really a, a way for him to work out a lot of this, and then there's a kind of prescription at the end. The general, the general overview or sense that Schaefer is trying to push here is this kind of like, Aegon between nature and modern man and how we are losing nature and it's it's you know about this kind of uh environmental degradation uh and the the noise that overwhelms that um uh which we have a uh, sort of i guess a uh, a lot to say <laughs> yes, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um uh you know it's very much it's very much uh uh instantiated in in the description of the cover that's just like folded in as a really tiny note uh on on the second page on the interior cover uh the the cover picture is a graphic level recording of a concert of frogs interrupted by a noisy automobile the car succeeded in silencing the frogs for several seconds but eventually they returned and i see this as being a kind of instantiation of like uh schaefer's kind of desire for like the natural world, the interruption of the thing, and this the return to the chorus of frogs uh, is generally this 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 kind of overview sensitivity. Uh, and then it begins with with an epigraph. Yeah. <laughs> so so um, you know, I think I think this is significant for a number of ways. Uh, Schaefer is here, uh, and I really do prefer to think about this as orchestration. So this is yeah. this is a, a you know really the, the you know the first the first introduction of a, of a voice into this document, and it is here a um, Squamish Indian prayer, um, which is curious for a number of reasons, even before. I Michael did some of the, the archival research, but we, you know, in very rare cases, do we refer to our work as prayers? Um, in, in, even in the ceremonial context, the longhouse, big house context, we don't, it, it's a it's a strange thing to, to have something called a prayer. Um, even in the colonial context where our work is called other things, it's mm -hmm. it, for, for, for Coast Salish folks, it's not really a language that we we um, we deploy as much, um, but then even the the concepts that are referred to within this, um, you know, uh, the 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 you know the the language and the the ways that we would we would open or address our non-human relations are very buried within this. So you could say buried or or just not present for me in a lot of ways as a Squamish. Um, perspective and so there's a consistency here I, you know I don't speak as a Squamish person but as a coast as someone who is uh, joined to my relatives who are Squamish uh, in this larger category of Coast Salish uh, practice um, you know our different communities in this region we have a lot of more similarities than differences in how we do things in our languages specifically uh, as well so it was a very kind of sharp disruption to how I was I was I was put in, I was uh, interpolated by this by this uh, by this particular voice of a of a community that I am uh, always in relationship with uh, through my family and and you know being here now, um, but also you know came to think of it a little bit as a as a, um, a gesture of an Indian guide you know this is the person that is supposedly leading us leading us in and and Schaefer is doing you know some work from his um, perspective here when this is published beginning with an indigenous gesture which we can think of as 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 an important thing to do but however I, I think it, we I, could I, talk I, about I, the context I, of what this actually is yeah it's it's actually uh, the words of a the, the best sources that I found that describe this text are, it, it's a translation of a Lakota Sioux uh, chief uh, from the 1860s to 1870s. Uh, and th this text was originally collected, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, the wife of uh, Frederick- uh, Theodore? Uh, Fra Franklin. <laughs> Franklin, yeah. <I> like, <laughs> <laughs> Roosevelt. <laughs> Uh, who who was an anthologist of 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 North American uh, words, language, uh, poetries, mm -hmm. literatures, mm -hmm. uh, included this in one of her anthologies. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it just became this fascinating thing of this transposition of 
uh, Schaefer wanting to, I mean, I would Im imagine that he had, yeah, like possibly would have known this because it, 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 the 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 author of this seems to have circulated with the text quite clearly, and for for him to transpose this to the, the to a, a Squamish context, oh, it could have been done by someone else, yeah, falsely before Schaefer as well. I mean, we don't have the archival research on that, That's but true. whatever the you know whatever the the kind of origin story of this of this prayer is, I think it's important to to note that this is a um, you know that the Squamish. Uh, folks would have been the first point of contact that Schaefer had uh, living in the area. So we did, you know, we have spent time in Ambleside in the area that Schaefer lived in and, and you know, Squam Squamish Reserve has been there um, uh, and Squamish folks before the reserve reserve system was was in place. But certainly surrounding uh, Schaefer were Squamish folks, <laughs> you know, uh, these are his first, um, you know, the, the kind of people that he could have or would have been in relationship with here to to um, possibly collaborate with or talk talk to at the very least. Um, so so I think it's important here just for me to, we, we have a lot we wanna say and, yeah. and to move on here. And yeah. this is just the opening gesture, but but this is a really the first instance of kind of using um, this prayer as a, to, to, to set the work that is that is coming, um, you know, uh, that that is really, you know, serving uh, Schaefer's agenda here, rather than giving voice to Squamish Squamish people and Squamish folks whose lands he is going to be talking about, um, you know, Van this place called Vancouver through the rest of the the you know the the pamphlet or the the book here and um, the Vancouver soundscape. Yep. So. Schaefer then moves on to bring in a, a variety of ear witness accounts um, to continue this, this orchestration. Um, and one of the things uh, I think unsurprisingly, given the first gesture of the, or the, you know, talking about the frogs disrupted by the automobile, mm. um, he situates the beginnings of the Vancouver soundscape here through these ear witness accounts in silence and solitude. These, these are the central concepts that really pervade um, all of these, all of these accounts. Um, and, and certainly there is a, you know, for those of you that are familiar with, uh, you know, the forests here, um, there is a sense of alterity, you know, that that is distinctive about being in 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 this kind of forest. Mm -hmm. um, and even my thinking about my own experiences of listening within this kind of place, I, I think um, we were talking a little bit of the experience of sound being absorbed into, or maybe I was saying that more, but the the way that sound is taken up by the forest um, in a in a really interesting and unique way that is still not silence. Um, but but what I want to emphasize in this kind of the the beginnings of these ear witnesses ear witness accounts is that. Um, there's a very there there's a very sharp similarity here for me in the way that both Emily Carr, who who Schaefer refers to and and brings in as part of his perpetually throughout the text like throughout the text as well, he's a certain authority throughout the text, and also um, others accounts from um, George Vancouver and mm -hmm. um, you know Captain the, the person who who this place is <laughs> named after. Um, it, the the similarity or the kind of the way that silence and solitude who's drawn in throughout the beginning of this, for me, works in a very similar way to Group of Seven paintings or Emily Carr's paintings that actually actively silence Indigenous voices um, by lack of any reference to that being a part of the soundscape, um, you know, which we, we have always had uh, you know, significant presence here, all of our communities, but also more recently through the work of Khmachquim uh, folks, particularly mm. we've, we, you know, we, we have have presented the this this our history of this place being a city is the city of Sesnam before the city right where we have the, you know our presence was was felt um you know not sort of dis, not not sort of dissipated by the forest or sort of we were not in hiding or or just not present we were you know this this presence is just as is equally as significant sonically as well um, and so it's quite um, quite important to note that what this that this silence is an active for me at least is an active silencing of our voices in this place. Yeah, 
And and it's interesting the use of the quotation uh, to create a sort of like multivocal, per, like broad perspectival, uh, uh, per, like perspective onto onto this landscape that 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 Schaefer is describing. Uh, just we were talking about this kind of mode of 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 the the sort of fragmented quotational use and. Uh, you know, automatically, I think of Benjamin, who writes, Walter Benjamin, who writes about his citation being, uh, there's this wonderful quote where the, how he uses quotations, uh, like, as though they were wayside robbers on the side of the road to uh, leap out and relieve the stroller bot, stroller of of his convictions. And I I joked with Dylan just prior to it, it's, it's as though uh, Schaefer is engaged in a very different sort of practice, like w wanting to actually have these quotations serve as an actual sort of uh, authority of the state, as though though they were like the quotations of the RCMP or something, <laughs> something like or that. The Indian agent, maybe. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's it. Uh, and you know, they, I'll just bring very quickly this kind of attention to this one quote from from uh, Emily Carr here of. Uh, just speaking to Dylan's point about uh, uh, the absorption of sounds, but uh, according to Carr that, and this is Schaefer centers this, gives this a lot of privilege. If you spoke your voice in this forest, your your voice came back to you as your face is thrown back to you in a mirror. Um, and I just, I thought of this as like a sort of uh, a fascinating instantiation of settler perspective in this in this forest to, to go into it and only be able to see one's 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 resemblance and not be able to acknowledge or 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 come into relation with anything else that might be in that space mm -hmm. <laughs> this is this is the page this is the page the this quite dramatic page after after the silencing <laughs> do you want to talk about this <laughs> yeah well maybe you, you start i mean i i would like to get to uh, ellen or how are we doing for time i want to make sure i always get lost in time here. yeah we, we actually just have a few minutes left the, the, this is obviously rich work you're unpacking so i hate to stop you but uh, yeah. we do want to get our other speaker into yeah so, absolutely so just just to note after the silence it's 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 labor uh what what comes is industry and it's like the rise of of modern man who is industrious following water and forests according to Schaefer, the keynote sound is lumbering. Uh, he describes virgin evergreen forests that both amazed and perturbed settlers. He notes that it was there out of their uneasiness within them and their desire for space and sunlight that they began to produce this this other keynote sound, the noise of lumbering. So um, we're the you know the phase we're in right now is doing this you know return return to the sort of archival primary research in this document um, but we've been talking a lot about what it means to stay with this form or use this form in one way or another to um, you know as an as an aesthetic that it might be interesting to um, find ourselves in relationship with. Uh, and also, and so for that reason, one of the things I was thinking about is that inaugural gesture of how of welcome from here. Mm. And one of the ways that we do that, obviously, uh, you know, and this maybe we can jump to the yeah to the welcome figure here, well, which I've um, given a lot of prior consideration to in in some of my uh, work mm. as a as a gesture that has migrated and been translated in ways by the state and. Um, you know, by by settler folks as as one of open arms and generosity, but in fact, this this figure calls us as 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 people from here to an accountability and to a different kind of listening, mm -hmm. because when we approach from the water to any other community or nation, um, this 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 gesture of the welcome figure asks us to state the the reasons we are there through canoe protocol um you know to to be uh, I, you know i hesitate to say as an immigration official but it but the seriousness of that moment i think is is there in 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 the work that happens and the the ways that we are called to respond and listen to our relation to the relationship between us 
and our our the ho our hosts potential hosts if they, if we are welcomed onto another's territory so you know we the, the this is often thought of as a as a material visual gesture of of welcome um but i one of the things i'm interested to think of is how this calls us into a different practice of listening and how we might think about mm -hmm. this as not just merely a generosity and welcome with open arms but actually asks us to do some significant work yeah that's and, that's wonderful, and 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 yeah, th this is this is one of the points that we're imagining as 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 a sort of response to what we're reading, uh, in Schaefer. You know, other points that we talked about is as just like thinking about the 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 soundscape of development of high rise development of condos, thinking about infrastructural listening, uh, mm -hmm. and, and this this these sort of modes and practices of listening, being sort of oriented through this kind of practice that Dylan has just described. Um, and uh, just as like a, a final point for me, one of the things that I've been fascinated by in, in reading uh, Schaefer's Vancouver Soundscape uh, is, uh, yeah, what he can't hear, what 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 becomes uh, what becomes so what in in thinking so much about sites sites in a landscape and practices of listening i'm fascinated by the by all that he can't hear in that and and is unwilling to hear in that mm -hmm. and i think of a, a clear example that dylan and i have discussed is 1959 franz fanon writing from algeria this is the voice about Al algeria and and how he's able to articulate per, positional listening essentially as as, as dylan writes about uh, a, a sort of positional listening that is differentiated as opposed as opposed to the sort of universalizing gesture of 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 listening and sound that is that is total throughout. Mm -hmm. uh, so part of me has been imagining a Fanonian world soundscape project <laughs> these last few days, and we've been we've been kind of making, uh, you know, uh, uh, imagining what that what that might look like and sound like. So we'll end it there and sorry for going a little bit over yeah. but no 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 this is this is exciting work gosh i'm um uh thank you so much thank you okay uh, so i my my mouth is bubbling with things i'd like to say so i'm going to stop myself from doing that and mickey would you please turn your camera on and we'll move right to your presentation i'll spotlight oh, yeah. you and, there we go and i'm going to share my screen um uh, because i have your uh what do i got here go ahead and start and then i'll share my screen with the link to your sound file yeah. my web designer just uh built it this morning uh for, for us so sorry this is in the spirit of the last minute work that i always do so <laughs> thank you ellen and thank you everybody and uh happy good day mickey valley tier two canada research chair in sound studies at athabasca university I live in Blackfoot Territory Treaty 7 in Southern Alberta, home of the Nitsitapi. Uh, I also am a research consultant uh, and partner with Red Crow Community College in Standoff, Alberta, which is home of the Blood Tribe. I live in Okimistake in the mountains on the Alberta BC border. Uh, my little talk, uh, which I decided on a title this morning, is called uh, After the Ear. And my approach to sound, uh, it continues to be, has always been inspired by this little famous maxim that, uh, and, and thank you uh, thank you to the previous presenters for exploring this, the limits of our ability to critique uh, R. Murray Schaefer, but it's one of these familiar maxims that needs to be unpacked, of course, which is that hearing is touching at a distance. Um, definitions in sound philosophy abound that do not mention touch, but seem to either uh, otherwise presume it. Um, and in the philosophy of sound, colonized largely by mind-body dualistic approaches to sound as sense and reductive approaches to sound as wave or sound as quality or sound as propagation or sound as vibration are reductive ways of thinking through sound. Um, and uh, th this morning also, I just talked to my Blackfoot uh, friend and one of my main guides, uh, Elder Calvin Williams from the Blood Tribe. And he told me, we talked about the definition of sound and he told me the, the um, well, we talked about a few definitions of sound. There wasn't one stable definition necessarily, but the sound meaning 
which means uh, which means that any sound that is uh, present or any sound that we hear, not, not on a level of abstraction, like a general sound, but what we hear could be anything that breaks the silence. That was an interesting point in the conversation as well. We, uh, I was talking to, a, uh, we were also talking in a group yesterday, some of us were talking about how sound breaks the silence. And so this definition of sound actually really, it was, it was interesting because it's like the sound that we hear, the sound that we hear, the sound that we hear, uh, defining words for the Nitsitati is about embedding a term in a network of relations and no term stands on its own. So it's, it's this definition that's uh, very much about the um, uh, ongoing process of sound. So anything that breaks the silence, we tend to take as being noise, as we've talked about repeatedly in the conference or the symposium today, something intrusive or an invader to our regulated soundscapes. Um, one of these, you know, interesting theorists that I like reading about sound and noise is Michel Serre as well, who's been a, a French philosopher uh, from Stanford, passed away a few years ago, um, but sort of the, one of the silent partners of the post-structuralist movement and now in the post-humanist movement seems to be very influential. Um, where he talks about noise as this sort of uh, ongoing condition of sound as a, rather than being an inter interrupted. But the soundscape, you know, as we take it to be a healthy soundscape when it's uninterrupted is embedded in our more extractionist practices of being quiet when we listen to a soundscape, uh, pretending we aren't there. Um, is that book recently written by Mark Peter Wright that explores that idea of listening after nature. It's a really good book and great articles by, by Mark in that. Um, and so if breaking the silence is, it could be a working definition of sound, it lends us insight into sound as a process, right? Not as an event and an object thing, quality, secondary quality versus primary quality, but as, an, as, as a life, a life, a life force, right? So I'm looking for a relational ontology in my research on bioacoustics and conservationist bioacoustics, especially with human, animal, plant, and planet relationships in a liminal space, mainly in the wildlife corridors, the parks, and the recreation areas, and the traditional territories of Southern Alberta. Um, and I work in research with environmental conservationists, with hunters, fishers, and tourists, and talk about the relationships with dogs, cats, bears, buffalo, eagles, owls, fish, cows, pigs, foxes, frogs, sheep, mice, elk, moose, chickens, and their continuing complex relationship with the changing weather patterns and the wild winds, storms, and landslides, rocks, and water woven, uh, water woven at the base of the mountains where it's the home of the trout. Um, bioacoustics, uh, I have on the website here, this, uh, this is a, a bioacoustics recording of uh, playing fetch with my dog. Uh, in the uh, Castle Region Mountains, again in the Oki Mistake uh, region of this area. And bioacoustics tends to be typically reductive, uh, isolationist, uh, tends to perpetuate the idea of the natural, um, but this is also the type of work that the hard science is the natural science, objectified sciences do, and finding spaces for relationships between the sacred sciences and the conservationist uh, efforts of University of Alberta and other places that look at bioacoustics research is a continuing fascinating kind of point. Um, so typically bioacoustics tends to reduce an animal's voice to an intersection between physics and biology, bioacoustics, right? But they often leave out, and quite often really leave out, the experiential or the phenomenological or the relational, and that's no fault of their own. It's in their training to isolate and objectify, to uh, parse out the experience from the object, to look for the ideal plateau of abstraction in our continuing engagement with experience, to separate out the primary from the secondary qualities while they're uploading massive amounts of data to global resources in order to track migration and biodiversity levels. So maybe it's more conservative, some of my approaches too, where I talk to all kinds of people and work with all kinds of people and conservationists and uh, fisher, fishermen uh, and hunters uh, and uh, people who give us, who used to also give us great insights into biodiversity. 
uh, sacred sciences, like I said, also play a part. Um, so sound is something that we feel, it's something as a force. So I wanna be quick with this, I'm sorry. Um, there's, there's a lot of talk about sound as force lately uh, and sound as territory, sound in sound studies, sonic territory, sonic barriers, the perforated horizon of the body where the located ocular centric projection of the body is complicated by this proprioceptive immersive surround sound, our oral space, the pain threshold that Schaefer had described in the soundscape. Um, the, lots, of, lots of stuff on the boundaries that are produced through sound, but through that also the affirmative identity productions uh, through sound and the sonic. Um, but I'm looking at these uh, recordings uh, as ongoing processes where the recordist is part immersed in it. Uh, so a lot of my research has to do with giving out different kinds of audio devices to volunteers in co different conservation society, the Bear Smart program. Uh, I'm doing a big research project on relationships with bears and voices and humans and more ethical relations between human and bears um, and uh, other they, they carry watch microphones. I also have a, a large number of aut uh, autonomous recording units that I, I put out into uh, wild spots that I can only access with an ATV um, and uh, things like that. But the, the one I wanted to sh uh, play, thanks, Ellen. Uh, if you want to play that uh, for me, it's, it's just a, a minute or so of a recording of uh, um, uh, <clears throat> acknowledging the listening body. Uh, this is a, this is self recording of playing uh, playing fetch with my dog Mika uh, in in the in the waters of uh, Castle uh, Castle River. Uh, th thanks, Ellen. Well, and there she goes, uh, going away from the microphones. Just kind of continuing going back and forth. It's quiet for a second. You can see in the bio, it's right there she comes. <laughs> And playing fetch is a way of uh, making a composition out of uh, membrana foam. Okay, sorry, she surprised me there. Uh, making compositions out of membrana foams, uh, like walking on the earth and on, on the water, of making music out of cordophones, where my feet glide across the ripples in the water and over the blades of grass, and idiophones, where the stick hits the water and aerophones where the dog growls through the stick in her mouth, which emits a surprise and a laughter from myself. And the wind hits the microphone sometimes with a tremendous force is another kind of earthly uh, aerophone. And the digiphones, which is the events captured as an event. Um, and they all respond to different movements of the recording. So as much contact as we garner from a sound recording whereby a microphone is immersed in its place, uh, there's one sound we will always want to avoid, which is the contact that you hear right now, which is the wind on the microphone. Ellen, I'm happy you can stop it now. That's all good. Thank you so much. That website is made through NeoCities, which is like, um, uh, uh, NeoCities is like a, a, re a resurgence of um, data sovereign uh, websites where your data isn't sold to Google like it is through WordPress or through Cargo or through uh, the more dominant forms of uh, knowledge mobilization. Uh, these are uh, uh, places where the, and, and talking to, uh, you know, uh, talking a lot about data sovereignty lately. So we're trying to find alternative ways to upload data without it being the data being shared with uh, big companies. Uh, so NeoCities is a nice place if you know how to do basic web design. Um, but I'm also kind of into this, uh, this idea of, uh, of touching and to end on touch where a microphone is immersed in place uh, and we record uh, we isolate all kinds of instances where the microphone present uh, present is made aware than isolated in instances where all of the things that contact one another have a similar kind of uncomfortable zone. We don't like our fingers touching microphones. We don't like the wind touching microphones. I do have a recording of this fetch experience that I had where the, there she goes, uh, where the, the, um, uh, the, the watch microphone I was using got immersed underwater and it clogged all the watch uh, microphone for a little while. It's a really beautiful recording because the water keeps touching the microphone like that, but uh, it just doesn't really, um, it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really come across as like a, yeah, anyway, it, it, more to unpack there. Um, but these zones are really interesting, these contact zones that turn them into sounds. Uh, recording never really accesses those points of contact, uh, but rather lives in the echoes of sound, right? After the force is exerted, the force has a trace, the force is the echo, right? 
uh, search, searching the contact zones. These contact zones are explosive and combustive and flammable. They're sparks, they're painful. The wrestling of a plastic bag is too loud for someone with hyperacusis or living with that or becoming autistic is the becoming of these contact zones and the frequencies of their contacts and their energies and how they disturb the inner ear or the tube. Uh, people with damaged tubes from uh, loud music, for instance, that can become flattened and fluttered like a physical reaction of something being touched inside the body. Uh, so explosions of the soul explosions of the unknown, not beneath our perception or above our perception, but too much sensation for our perception to understand. Um, a lesson to be learned from hyperacusis. Um, so uh, that, that's my presentation. I appreciate the, uh, the, the opportunity to speak and the, and the welcoming and the greeting and to speak on Carl's land. I hope you have a very good day and uh, thank you for letting me uh, join you presentations today thank you Ellen. thank you Ellen. thank you michael we're, we're at two o'clock but I, it we with the permission of uh doug and patricia who i've direct messaged um I, I would like to take some time for questions and discussion because these were both such rich uh such rich presentations and we have the the cushion of a little break uh later that we can eat into so um what i'm going to do is spotlight you both and if Folks in the room would like to, I can't multitask. Not, <laughs> I mean, folks in the room would like to either put your hand up so I can see you uh, or um, uh, write your questions in the chat. That would be great. So we, we do have a question from uh, Deb, Deb Sinha. Michael mentioned infrastructural listening in passing. I'm intrigued by this idea. Can we speak more about this as infrastructure is often invisible or inaudible, but permeates how the environment is expressed? I guess thinking further, this could apply to infrastructures, human and non-human, urban or rural. Yeah, and, go ahead. Th th thanks so much for that question. Uh, I, I'm thinking a lot about infrastructure uh, these days. And, and, uh, and so, you know, there, there, there's something Schaefer alludes indirectly to a possibility of infrastructure when he discusses ketone uh keynote sorry uh and and it's he talks about like the anchor fundamental tone the reference point that everything else takes on the special meaning uh they become listening habits in spite of themselves and infrastructure is usually like the embedded uh the embedded network or system that allows for all sorts of different possibilities to to take place upon it and and so specifically when i think of infrastructural listening you know the the examples that we were sort of briefly discussed was like thinking about like actual natural uh resource extraction infrastructure which which is very present on these lands uh, and the way that that impacts and orients and uh, becomes a paradigm for listening. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the the image uh, that Dylan showed of the welcoming figure uh, statue, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, it's it's gesturing towards these these cargo ships uh, uh, in the in the one image. And, you know, that is the other sort of infrastructural uh, another sort of logistics infrastructure the, of, of moving uh, these containers and, and all of our goods being uh, premised upon. Of course, the, the logistics infrastructure is also interrelated and based upon and absolutely imbricated with the natural resource extraction infrastructure. And so what, what are ways that these, these infrastructures actually create the paradigm for our attention, for our listening, for our sensibility. It's it's something that's actually been a main uh, question uh, for me over the last year or so. Mm -hmm. I just to add a small bit that I think Vancouver is one of very few places, at least very few places in Canada where you there there is um a sense of indigenous infrastructure or or you could also say infrastructure maybe it's infrastructural adornment at certain <laughs> points where 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 form line is embedded within the fabric of the city where um well, it was northern form line maybe not not necessarily coast salish um aesthetics um but you know language as well more recently certainly here at university of british columbia hunkamanum is everywhere which is a really interesting uh you know kind of guide for how we orient ourselves 
themselves to this place, but also through the sound of that, which is often um, not present alongside the visuals. So, so thinking, I, I'm, I'm interested to also think of infrastructure not as a sort of um, entirely uh, settler colonial thing, but think through what resurgent so, infrastructures might allow us to do otherwise. Listen, listen otherwise, I guess, yeah. Mickey, does this idea have resonance for you? <laughs> I'm in the middle of sonic infrastructure. The smoke alarm is going off and there's somebody mowing the lawn outdoors. <laughs> oh, it's, all good. it's all good. No, no which, which one though? There's Dylan and uh, Michael's research is oh. like rich, rich with concepts and ideas. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm just wondering, Mickey, whether, whether this idea of infrastructural listening um, has meaning for you or, I mean, you seem to be talking about something more phenomenological, something more, more about soft tissues you know yeah no i mean there's a you know there's the in, in i mean infrastructure i guess can mean technological in one way and infrastructure can can be social infrastructure in another you know um uh i guess like with the the, the kind of infrastructural stuff that i'm looking for is like you know on one side i'm, I'm looking at like um a laboratory that I bring around with me, right? But the infrastructure is also where, like the, the infrastructure isn't something silently underneath, it's something that people like engage with and make space with, right? You can have a blank screen and then you bring a projector to it, it becomes a new infrastructure that's experiential. And so I don't know if I divide the phenomenological and the infrastructural uh, with each other so much as maybe my candidacy exams are in semiotics and phenomenology in the way that signs are experienced directly, you know? And so like the more of the technological kind of infrastructure that I take around with me doesn't really come alive. Like, like, a, like the way that um, uh, conservation biologists that I work with, uh, the way that they conceive in infrastructure is the way that like the Canadian Foundation for Infrastructure works, which is, it's like, like they have a neutral space concept. You know, you put the space in and then the people come in and use it for the way that the infrastructure is intended to be used. Um, some of my work kind of works like this, like I do tradition, not sorry, not traditional, but like, um, you know, natural sciences, bioacoustics research, I put my autonomous recording units out into remote locations, I track, you know, uh, passages of animals through wildlife corridors and things like that. But other other uses for the infrastructure are when, um, you know, we're going to be doing a big project on on giving out um, 40, 40 tape recorders to as part of my infrastructural lab giving 40 tape recorders out to uh, students in Red Crow Community College at the Blood Tribe, just, just, just to see what they do with them. And uh, the, the way that we're talking so far is, uh, is, is from, their, uh, from their usage. And, and this is data that I can't share with anyone because they're, uh, they're data sovereign. And so sharing that data afterwards is something, it has to show that it goes back into the community first. So we're going to store these tapes. Uh, they can't be shared, and they're going to be contributing to the community. Is there going to be these um, little audio tape recorders that are, are going to be stored at their research facilities over there? Um, but they're, the way that they use that recording infrastructure is is typically um, less about you know being being quiet and listening to the soundscape, and they just sort of more are just present, and they're just they're part of the life. Um, like I said, as before, that conception of sound as something that is intruded on by noise is uh, is kind of like, I don't know, it's, it's not so diametrically opposed, like everything comes in pairs, but uh, it's not so diametrically opposed. So I have multiple perspectives on the notion of infrastructure. And, you know, like a like a hunter, like I'm talking to, to hunters from the Pincher Creek area and going on hunts with them and stuff. And their question of infrastructure is all made through like, um, you know, soft boots and walking quietly through the woods. And then this blast of a, you know, not an over under shotgun, but like a 270 or a Winchester 3030 or something like that. You know, there's their notion of what is a soundscape as it's, in, as it's you know, punctuated by these eruptive moments and explosions and things like that. Their infrastructural, their sonic infrastructure is a very, it also has a really, unique perspectival um use of silence and noise and uh anyway i i, I, I think like, i'm sorry like dylan and, and michael like i i could i could just <laughs> research is so much fun to talk about right so i, I think i, I should know, like to have you all for dinner <laughs> Yeah, that's why I wanted to be in Ottawa. I know, I know. Um, listen, I, I think what we need to move on, alas, but I, I do think that there's a nice connection here yeah. um, to a comment by R. Gates in the chat. He says it's a little bit of an opaque 
question, but I'm curious about the idea of sonic touch in relation to infrastructure. And I think what you just, you know, spoke of that, 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 in, you know, cleaving of the atmosphere is, is and that visceral quality of sound is, uh, is a really good response to that, actually. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you all very much. To be continued, and uh, uh, we'll we'll move on to our next presentation. Um, yeah, applause. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Right. I really appreciate it. <laughs> nice to meet you finally, Dylan. Love your book. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and very jealous of your uh, writing residency. Um, I'm sure that a lot of us in here are. <laughs> All right, I am going to try to keep my head here as the afternoon goes on and uh, spotlight our next two presenters. If I could ask Patricia and Doug to turn their cameras on, You're, you've been made co-hosts, so um, then I'll introduce you and we'll carry on. Geez, I'm glad to see you here. Uh, I, I think I'll spotlight uh, Doug as our first speaker here. Um, I've been a great admirer of Doug's work for a really long time, and we're so lucky to have Patricia Campbell um, at Carleton this year as a distinguished Fulbright teaching uh, research professor. Um, Doug is a public music educator, which sounds easy to say, but but there's volumes of influence and work and creative uh, activity there. Um, he's a musician. He worked closely with Armory Schaefer on his education initiatives, and he's a PhD candidate at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education uh, in Canada. So I'm, I'm really glad to have you here. And as I said, Patricia Sheehan Campbell is Fulbright Canada Distinguished Research Chair at Carleton University and Professor Emerita from the University of Washington and her work crosses ethnomusicology and music education. She's a very influential scholar in that realm. So welcome both. Doug, take it away. Thanks, Ellen. Um, hi, folks. Uh, I'm truly honored to be here. I'm, I'm feeling super humbled and maybe a bit a bit shaky, um, but, I'm, but I'm very thankful to be invited. I, I, I'm glad that I'm next because as people present, I keep changing my stuff, you know, um, with all the amazing new learning. Um, I've been doing, and this presentation was ten minutes. So let's see, let's see how it, how it goes. Um, but I'm I'm super I'm super excited to be here. Um, so I want to start with um, two acknowledgments. One is more personal, a personal land acknowledgement that uh, Tara Goldstein at OISE, when I was teaching um, researching with her, um, asked her her research her her, her RAs to uh, write. And then the second is a commitment I start um, an acknowledgement and a commitment I start my classes with. Now, I know this is not a class, but it, it feels important to me, folks, considering what I'm going to say, to do some of the practices I do um, when I'm teaching high school students and or, or teachers. Um, so these so my Mennonite grandparents fled religious, religious persecution in the former USSR and finally ended up settling in Manitoba on Treaty 1 territory. The land of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, Dene, and Métis nations. I am a settler and I grew up helping farm land that was stolen and I have many, many privileges because of this. And then here's what I start my classes with. Um, I want to acknowledge that the major developments of music in North America have come from often, often appropriated racialized communities and that institutional music education is complicit in systemic racism, part of the problem, by still continuing to hold white European Western music at the center and above all other practices. I hope we can learn how I, I work and continue to learn how to push back on and disrupt this harmful tradition together. Um, and maybe today the disrupting versus perpetuating is kind of, I mean, I know those aren't two different things or, but that's kind of one of the topics of, of my presentation. So first Murray was a mentor and a close friend of mine. Um, of course, I knew what he said and did are not without fault. Nevertheless, my practice and research are very much patterned uh, by my reading of him and perhaps more significantly by the time I spent teaching and traveling with him. So um, as Dylan mentioned, I, I, I am a product, uh, what I do is a product uh, very much of, of Murray, my time with Murray. Um, I, I'm sorry to do this, but again, here comes a teaching practice, just so we're doing and feeling through some sounding and listening rather than just talking about it. Um, I wanna just start with some listening questions that I might use in my class, so please just if you, if you, if I'm inviting you to think about these um, on your own. So, what is the first sound you remember hearing this morning, and uh, can you imagine hearing it now? Mm 
one more. Um, can you think of a sound a close family member or friend makes? Significant sound, and can you imagine it now? How does it feel to recall this? Thanks for those answers, folks. I usually try and get uh, folks to describe the sounds. Um, anyways, I won't go there. I, I'll stick to my presentation. I'm here to talk about sound and listening pedagogies, what Murray called sound education and or ear cleaning. I'll give a short description of these and then I'll briefly talk about what these pedagogies have offered my own practice. Through the lens of more recent sound studies, I wanna suggest some updates and edits that might lead us towards a critical sound and listening um, pedagogy. And I'm very interested, of course, in, in folks' thoughts on these, if, if you're willing to offer. So two things to keep in mind. Please, please keep in mind that when I talk about music education, I'm not just talking about elementary and secondary schools where I practice. I am talking about post-secondary and graduate work also. In my mind, these are part of music education, the institution of music education. And perhaps these gatekeeping institutions might even be more a more central part and in most need of disruption. Um, I mention this in part because I find that ideas, you know, the arena of ideas and academic, more academic conversations often leave out teaching, teaching practice. I have a story about that, but we don't have time. We don't have time for it. So um, this seems true in regards to Schaefer. Um, so referencing only his theoretical reflections, research, um, and even his compositional products leaves out his practical suggestions that I think still might offer a different version of music education than the harmful and exclusive one we still often have today. Well, I love those answers. I really wish we could just talk about those, but thank you for offering those folks, but I'm going to stick to, to, to uh, so just as one example of teaching practice of Murray's, uh, in 1968, in an educational pamphlet reflecting on leading a class through a discussion on the question, what is music? Schaefer states, ultimately somewhere work might begin on a much needed history of oral perception to show us how different periods or different musical cultures actually hear different things when listening. Again, this was in 1968. Um, Schaefer's practice as an educator um, in elementary, secondary classrooms, post-secondary uh, graduate students, community groups outside of institutions, was committed to making a space for and celebrating the individual creativity, listening practices, and engagement of each person. In his teaching, joy, discovery, creativity, and community building are prioritized through observation of the entire sounding world and exercising our agency um, to individually and collaboratively mess with it and shape it. Um, in his practice, teaching practice, art was not a product, but a way of creative inter interacting with our world and each other. His educational writing to me does seem more curious and less conclusive um, and angry than his more theor theoretical work. Um, but we could talk about that for uh, anyways, another time. I should mention that, of course, Pauline Arrow Oliveros um, has her own take on sound and listening pedagogies, and I've done some research that, and writing that compares the two, but for purposes, I'll focus today on Murray. And of course, sound and listening go, comes way before <laughs> the World Soundscape Project in 19... Of course, it's, it's obvious, but I think it's important to mention. Um, so I'll try and briefly summarize his approach as presented in five educational pamphlets from the 60s to 70s and, and two books of listening and sound games and exercises, one from 96 and one from 2005. So his teaching practice of sound and listening involved asking participants and teachers what they hear and what they would change if they could. So prompts like, what is the most significant soundscapes or sound marks of your daily life? What sounds do you like most? Which ones would you change if you could? Um, two, they included challenges and innovations for deepening listening from sillier to more significant. So prompts like, who thinks they can stand without making a sound? Try it and we'll listen. Or let's go for a sound walk and just listen. When we get back, we can describe what we heard and how it felt. And three, um, these practices, these books show a facilitating of creativity, um, what I think Brendan LaBelle and maybe others would call sonic agency. So prompts like, Bring an interesting sounding object to class, like sound and tell, which I love doing with students. Let's each describe the sounds these make. Let's, let, let's then compose as a found sound orchestra. In a group, compose a piece of music inspired by a painting, by a nearby street corner, by a historical picture of your neighborhood. So I discovered these practices in 2005, a few years after I started teaching. And this was the first time I was able to imagine a music education that was different from the one I myself had, had experienced, which was a small town band program to learning how to be a band director from the podium with a baton. 
So the teach how you were taught pattern was for me short circuited by these practices. These pedagogies allowed me and my students a chance to create our own music, our own lessons, paths and inquiries, and we were doing so together as a community of learners. These practices helped us set aside narrow definitions of what music is, instead centering what it is and might be for each of us. I believe that these are still important and needed possibilities, disruptions from these practices. However, I do feel that if there's some of us that want to carry on this work, we also need to acknowledge tensions and mistakes within this work. So thanks to the work of Jennifer Stover, um, artists Christine Sun Kim, Dylan Robinson, Brendan LaBelle, Codewell Eschen, William Chang, I could go, but these are just a few of the many folks that I've been challenged and inspired by. I think we might move forward with a critical sound and listening pedagogies. So I feel that anyone interested in these critical sound and listening pedagogies must, so one, acknowledge privilege and power and make a commitment to stopping harm, exclusion, and shame and make these commitments and acknowledgements known to the people you're working with. So this means that we need to reject the easy placement of Schaefer and even Oliveros as avant-garde at the end of the Western European canon. So Murray's positions and pedagogies can just as easily perpetuate exclusion and privilege and power just as easily as they might disrupt it. And also, while we're trying to stop further exclusions and harm, we must continue to acknowledge the ten tensions, hypocrisies, and perpetuation of dominance that our own positions might maintain. So two, uh, these critical sound and listening pedagogies cannot be a fixed method. They must continue to adapt and serve individual, individuals and communities. That not, the, not the what, but the how. Not the exercises themselves, but the possibilities within and in between them. The exercises themselves are only useful if they help us collaboratively think beyond defaults. Think Murray knew this, but anyways, he, he made some stumbles for sure. Three, critical sound and listening pedagogies must take lessons from sound studies and add these to the exercises, games, and practice. So here are some lessons I've learned. Sound is not a separate sense. A new hierarchy of senses gets us nowhere. Um, sound is felt and embodied. Sonic experience is not singular. We all hear, feel differently, and this should be acknowledged and central to music education. And then, um, Finally, these critical sound and listen pedagogies must be willing to go the distance. So if we invite a student, a pre-service teacher, a post-secondary music learner, a research assistant, a teaching assistant, to tell us about the sounding and listening practice of their daily life, then this invitation needs to extend to allow. If these folks feeling, feel willing and safe, so that's important, it's, this invitation needs to extend to allow these practices to become central in developing our systems of education which includes course development and even systems of hiring. Um, a few further cautions to keep in mind, and this is maybe me kind of admitting some stuff. We folks in Canada, Canada, ironically where Murray was from, are not leading the way. Sound and listening pedagogies have not really taken hold here, but they have elsewhere. For example, we could learn much from the Latin American educators who translated and have been adapting Murray's work for over the last 40 years. Not only, and I want to mention them, Violeta de Genza and Marisa Fontarara, the Spanish and Portuguese translators of Murray's writing, but also their larger network of many students and collaborating teachers and researchers. Um, I've learned a lot from these folks and I'm very, very lucky that Murray connected me with them. And then another caution, if academic researchers are to have any role in making institutional music education better, sound and listening pedagogies are outside of them, I think that role has to be to facilitate and support local practitioners developing their research skills, crafting their own research projects, and publishing their own results. I'm sorry, I, I, maybe we don't need to say this, but I think the current competitive sole authored tenure track system seems to me antithetical to this work. So um, aspects of Schaefer's work are, of course, and indeed problematic, um, and so are many aspects of our institutions. His work, even the most basic lesson of listen and feel more deeply, even just the listening and improvising games, even the silly ones, might still help us music educators with a lot of colonial baggage to think beyond, to break the still hardwired circuit. But we must do so carefully, not fix another system, not feel that we know better than others, or that we as educators and researchers in a position of power have ever completely stopped perpetuating that power and control and even possible harm. Um, I guess above all, I hope that we might begin educational interactions, any of them, 
with listening rather than speaking. And I get the hypocrisy of me saying this to you after talking for 10 minutes. <laughs> Thanks for listening, folks. I'm looking forward to um, um, your thoughts and questions. Thank you so much, Doug. Uh, you, you said so many things that I agree with, and I love the way that you're extending uh, Schaefer's work and putting it into this into a critical framework that doesn't um, disallow it, but but that asks us to how what we can think through with it. Yeah, it's it's really amazing. I look forward to the conversation, and I'd now like to spotlight Patricia. Great, wonderful. Oh, Doug, thank you very much. Uh, Ellen, thank you for this this study day. It has been uh, so revealing, uh, having been here since 8.30 and totally enlivened by, by the ideas this afternoon, Michael and Dylan and Mickey and, and Doug now. Uh, I'm so grateful to be a part of this gathering here. Um, let me get the uh, screen share in here and, uh, and move us along on uh, what will be uh, a set of memes uh, rather than... Um, so many words, um, but uh, I've, I've had the pleasure uh, several weeks now uh, at Carleton, uh, and it's it's been a delight uh, to get to know some of the faculty, uh, to recognize the incredible resources uh, of the university, uh, of this uh, beautiful place, Ottawa, uh, the National Gallery of Art Canada has um, uh, as its theme, uh, this idea that everything is connected. And of course, in, in three languages uh, is how it goes. And I feel that way about today's uh, gathering uh, of scholars, of thinkers, of musicians, uh, that uh, there are connections across. And uh, it's, uh, it's just been marvelous um, as it continues on. Um, I have to say that I, don't know uh, the work of our Mary Schaefer the way you know it, Doug, or many others here today. Uh, I did have an encounter, however, as a brand new professor uh, at the University of Washington uh, in winter 1990, he did come to campus. And I think he was making many campus visits. And uh, uh, I remember a number of exercises, including the one uh, in wadding up the paper and uh, pitching it uh, at the wall and listening carefully and then attempting uh, to imitate that sound. And, and that stood um, as, a, as a very special experience. Uh, I have to say that um, I was weaned, however, uh, also um, as many uh, Americans were uh, on a number of his works. And, and for, for me, it was creative music education. Uh, this was a manual for those of us coming up uh, through university to become music teachers in the 1970s and 80s and even into the 90s. And in talking with some of our international colleagues, it turns out that this manual had, uh, uh, had some, some power uh, and presence uh, in places like Brazil and uh, Australia, the UK, and even translated into Hebrew in Israel. Uh, so there were, there were beautiful word balloons, but, but beautiful ideas and ideals uh, that uh, we played with and we worked with. And in a kind of a subliminal way, because I, I didn't take it any further than that book, um, I think it had uh, uh, some staying power with me. Uh, and so it, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to come a little more deeply into it uh, these days. I have to say that this, this idea of disrupting <laughs> music education is one that's been on my mind for a very long time and, and in, in, in what I've done, um, including redefining music studies uh, at the undergraduate level uh, when we did uh, work with a manifesto for change uh, some years ago. And how, of the, how all of that zigzags into the K-12 because we at the university are working with those who will go out into communities and out into schools and hopefully make for changes in the manner in which we approach um, uh, teaching learning as well as in the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the repertoire uh, that we select out. Uh, so many uh, AZ quotes, um, including this one, which is a favorite of mine. Uh, uh, the Schaefer spoke to stilling the noise in the mind uh, that if we get that task, everything else will follow. Uh, and that too has, has a, a, a sticking power for me. Uh, for, for a long while, I've been working with uh, listening up uh, with, uh, with um, um, prospective teachers and um, listening up 
uh, in order to, to, to learn through listening orally, uh, as well as uh, for the pedagogical integrity of it. But the listening is to the music, as well as to the musicians and what they have to say about the music, as well as to the learners, our very own students, and, uh, and what they bring, uh, as well as listening to the local uh, and to the world. So, so connections are certainly there. Um, earlier this morning, we heard specialists uh, uh, speak to us uh, uh, some on, on the phenomenon of hearing and uh, thinking about hearing acuity and also hearing loss uh, and how it is not always with us, uh, that it will decline. And I'm beginning to, to face that uh, in, in real time. Um, these, these various research uh, um, articles that, that bring to the, uh, to the point what Schaefer had spoken of, uh, that, that, uh, that the loud living um, may bring about uh, these neural disconnections, breakage of uh, synapses, and even the development of um, dementia. Uh, and uh, the striking um, uh, report of several years ago from Howard, uh, Harvard Health uh, that we may need 16 hours for recovery uh, from the noise uh, because the noise out there uh, becomes noise in the mind. Um, hearing and listening, we understand, is something a, a bit different. And those of us in education uh, are, are speaking to listening. Um, if we're directing some of what goes on in classrooms, uh, we're directing toward focused listening. Uh, and the listening becomes a voluntary. Uh, the listening becomes guided. It becomes intentional. And that is different than um, uh, hearing at large. For a while now, I've been uh, working within the realm of world music pedagogy, and uh, that seems to be at the seams between ethnomusicology and performance studies. And listening, uh, Schaefer's idea of listening and Oliveros and others uh, seems to come uh, uh, full circle and, and really rather into focus uh, in this world music pedagogy, walk into music of, uh, of people uh, across the world. Um, sustained listening, which is to say listening that is attentive, engaged and active in order that we can learn the music to perform it, to create something new, but in the style of the music studied, and, and then in the listening, uh, come to questions and answers as to why the music sounds the way it does, knowing its cultural context. And, and so uh, there again, there is this connection uh, that I'm feeling between uh, some of the works uh, of Schaefer and what we're doing in classrooms. Uh, working with Bonnie Wade uh, some years ago, we started the Global Music Series and she wrote Thinking Musically, and I wrote Teaching Music Globally, uh, in which we were attempting uh, to, uh, to make sense of a way of teaching music um, in places here and there across the globe through its elemental features, uh, and again, through a whole lot of listening. Um, in this world music pedagogy, you see that we've got listening at three levels. Uh, from the very uh, uh, basic uh, entry point of attentive, into participatory musicking while listening, participating, beginning to sing or to move, to dance, to embody in some way the music, all the way to learning a piece uh, completely without notation, completely enacting uh, the listening into performance, which then brings about possibilities for uh, creating uh, music that is influenced by uh, music from here and there in the world. And of course, over there on the side, there's always uh, this matter of, well, okay, well, what is this music uh, coming from whom and for what purposes? That's our world music pedagogy. And, and so, you know, in this work, uh, listening plays a part. And we're considering music and sound, probably music more than sound, as Schaefer uh, uh, would have uh, uh, spoken to it, but, but looking at it locally and looking at it uh, globally. And so teachers uh, with students uh, um, who are employing world music pedagogy um, at the university level or K-12 are considering commonalities and distinctions uh, and certainly looking to sonorities of people's everyday environment, speech and machinery, uh, sonorities of natural forces, 
Um, and they vary uh, from place to place to place on the globe, um, across the globe, uh, looking to environmental uh, materials from which the music is, uh, or musical instruments are constructed, and, and then even looking to the human and non-human activation of sound. Um, so there again is a little bit of a connect, I think, between uh, some aspects of Schaefer's work and, and what we're doing in the, the realm of, uh, of world music pedagogy. I go to a small village, uh, I've been there eight times doing some field work um, uh, for a festival. Um, it's a group called the Wagogo, they speak Chigogo, and their festival is Chigogo Tamasha. And, uh, and I go there to document the music. Uh, I'm writing on uh, musical enculturation and uh, in education and how festival is an educator. And so my attention is to the music of these groups and individuals, children to adults. Um, but I'm also interested through, again, Schaefer's soundscaping uh, possibilities uh, of this, uh, the way in which children and adults have been immersed in an environment that has particular sonic uh, uh, features that bring about uh, music uh, of a particular sort at the festival and even in the everyday. So, um, so looking now to some of the local scapes uh, that are so rich with sound, many of the folks are still herding cattle. Uh, and uh, so to hear the sounds of the cattle, uh, are they represented in the music? Uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, certainly um, music in the home. Uh, some of the sounds that appear at festival are right there in the home uh, in preparing meals in the socialization after meals. And then of course, my particular interest is children and how they play and how some of the games are musical as the way I would define melodic and rhythmic content. And some of it is linguistic, but that has musical uh, uh, potentials. Um, I have to say that um, a, a thing that's come up um, as I think about soundscape and listening uh, in, in a Schaefer and Schaeferian way, uh, uh, I, I, I run across this thing called wild pedagogies uh, coming from environmental scientists, uh, environmental educators, learning experiences in the wild. Uh, and this is something that is that is coming up, uh, reaching beyond the noise. Uh, these um, environmental ed ed educators are are looking to extend uh, student experiences in schools uh, beyond the overdoses of activity uh, to allow them to shift into stillness. Uh, and I find that fascinating. Um, interestingly, um, I didn't know about the Wolf Project, and and here. Uh, gathered today, the very fact that uh, there are folks that perhaps in some ways, the wild pedagogy people uh, will say, yeah, that's pretty close to what we do, except we don't think about the sounds to the extent that uh, uh, the richness uh, of sound was very much the point, it seems, in the Wolf Project. Um, just a few days ago, uh, my colleague and former uh, uh, doc student at uh, University of Washington, David Abair, uh, published this in the Canadian Journal of Environmental Education. And he's putting together wild pedagogies, world music pedagogy and soundscape. And he speaks about uh, uh, Murray Schaefer, you know, these uh, sort of connections, these, these overlapping ways in which um, maybe uh, we need to be thinking, those of us working in education. Just today, and this is getting perhaps a little bit further away, but I just want to make a plug for teachers. Um, uh, in the Atlantic, uh, uh, an article uh, today, What Americans Don't Understand About Teachers. Uh, and those of us who work at the university level and perhaps not with teachers uh, <laughs> um, aren't as close to the fact that teachers are are stretched. Uh, they're stretched to do what they can, and uh, they're teaching music. And what does that mean? How do we teach music? And there are so many varied ways. Uh, but this idea of, of coming back to ear cleaning, coming back to soundscape, or maybe moving into it for some of us who have never really uh, gone very far is, is something that we uh, really could be doing. Uh, teachers, again, have, uh, have, have a lot on their plates, uh, but it's, it's something uh, that uh, we could renew, refresh, and, uh, and, and bring into focus. Uh, just very quickly, um, it, it's, it's fascinating to me to recognize what teachers have done and are doing in the way of, of, of Schaefer's ideas. 
uh, came across a, a thing um, several years ago uh, at the National Arts Center, a uh, program called Music Alive meets the music of our Murray Schaefer. Uh, so right here in Ottawa, music programming for children at the National Arts uh, Center. And, uh, and a report from one of the, the teacher educators uh, was that we were all a little reticent and scared by it at the beginning, this idea of moving into Schaefer's music with teachers and children. But it's by far my favorite program uh, and the most creative, and teachers love it. They say it's really inclusive and understandable. And so a whole curriculum was put together uh, by the folks at the National Arts Center, uh, giving attention uh, to, to Schaefer's ideas and some of his music. Um, another point uh, raised by Samantha Kotkus, teacher educator, two minutes of silence. Uh, this is uh, for the gathering of these grades four, five, six at the National Arts Center. Listening for everything you hear, challenging the children to take that into their home life, to take two minutes and just listen. Schaefer connects to how we should listen to nature. And in so many places I travel, the students are much more attuned to the earth. And then I tie that to the music. So this is her comment uh, in terms of this programming going on, uh, again, uh, celebrating uh, Schaefer's ideals. Program notes for teachers. You can just take a quick glance at this and know uh, that, um, that teachers could walk away uh, with, uh, with these ideas, as well as with some of the music, uh, which uh, simmered and, and actually shook up uh, and astonished uh, some of their children. There were other take-home follow-ups to this uh, programming at the National Arts Center. And uh, as you see here, uh, coming out of uh, his, his many writings, his, his many experimentations and explorations and, uh, and clearly influences. Um, and, uh, and so students, uh, teachers walked away with, uh, should say in the programming also, the presence of a graphic notation uh, that could be taken on again you know, into the schools from the National Arts Center. The idea of soundscape and the idea of ear cleaning. Um, and then a final page uh, of the program booklet, uh, which would allow teachers to take with students uh, uh, further escapades uh, into the realm of, uh, of, of Schaefer. Uh, so Schaefer uh, and Music Alive at the National Arts Center. Just two more uh, little points to make. Actually, it looks like it's, uh, it's chock full. But it seems that trending in North American music education are, are, are these matters. Uh, um, and, and when we are teachers 24-7, uh, it seems sometimes, um, uh, we're finding that we are compelled to meet standards and we wanna change standards. Uh, change is, is gradual. Uh, take it from me after 35 years. <laughs> um, uh, we find uh, that trending our, uh, our, our questions of music literacy, uh, music literacies over orality and orality. So less listening and more notation, right? The named pedagogies uh, are important. Uh, in many K-12 uh, settings. Performance excellence. So that really drives uh, the engine out of a, a lot of K-12, doesn't it? Uh, music at competitions, festivals, and con contests. Uh, music for school and community service, hence the marching bands. Music for students across all kinds of uh, experiences and ages. Uh, popular music rising in guitar bands. Um, and, uh, and, and songwriting over uh, soundscapes and compositions. That's, these things seem to be trending. I think you could add a few or maybe uh, uh, um, remove uh, several of these uh, in your own locale. Um, but I see the pathways to transforming music education wherever we may be. Uh, and, and that could well be at the university level uh, as well as uh, in the schools. Uh, primary, secondary grades is a, is a continuing uh, thrust uh, and energy to, to open up the circle of what music is, uh, to recognize the sound to music continuum, um, to, to modify the standards, to continue to press for modifications, um, to mix the disciplines, the fields, the subjects within the curriculum environmental scientists with folks in music. Uh, for example, thinking of and listening to and acting in local communities, 
as well as globalizing and multiplying the local, uh, the local sources seems to be important. Um, it, it, it very much seems that uh, uh, we could be moving towards overlaps. And, uh, and some of us uh, are there, soundscapes, wild pedagogies, uh, world music pedagogy, and that we can, in fact, uh, go from sound to music and maybe from wilds uh, to the world. Um, it's a big task. It's a heavy agenda. Um, but I will say that uh, uh, visiting with people this day and uh, hearing the amazing ideas, uh, profound that they are, uh, stimulate uh, uh, stimulates for me uh, many ideas for uh, curricular change and, and uh, once again reignites uh, energy uh, for moving in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you so much. Um, and and uh, it's great the energy that you bring to this conversation as well. We we are nominally close to our uh, at our break time, but I think we should take a few minutes for questions here, and we'll maybe split the difference and have questions and comments for about seven minutes so that we do get a little bit of a of a pause santé before we we continue. So I'm going to spotlight both of you and ask folks to either put questions in the chat or to um, put up your hand so I can see you and uh, and you can ask your question. Kathy Armstrong has a question. Uh, I'll, I think I've done the right thing, Kathy, to make you unmute. Hmm. Yes, I received a message ordering me to unmute. So I, I said yes. <laughs> I'm really sorry about this. <laughs> this it's all good. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you both. They're really, really great presentations. Um, I guess something that uh, I, I tweaked to right away in your presentation, Doug, was just, you know, um, your comment about how often music education is just sort of a K to 12 concept. And I mean, with a, I have a long background in music education, but I've never taught in the K to 12 system, uh, except for sort of uh, uh, guest workshops. And so thinking about, um, uh, you know, just the connection to community, the connection to post-secondary, that what actually goes on in our music programs in post-secondary is, in fact, music education. I'm just, and of course, Patricia, you know, you you have this um, in your experience all, also just in terms of connecting teachers, but connecting communities. And, you know, just if, if either of you and or both of you could just comment a little bit more on that, because it's always... Um, it's always kind of puzzled me that that we don't think of ourselves as a lot of people, I think, don't think of themselves as educators in the post-secondary um, system. And as you say, there's a lot of institutional barriers towards, um, you know, collaboration and and that kind of stuff. So I, I just wondered if you could say a bit more about that. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Why don't you go ahead, Doug? Um, thanks for the question. I, um... I, I maybe I'll just tell two kind of brief stories in, in, in response, if that's okay. So um, I don't blame this person, but um, in one of my music education, uh, uh, it wasn't in a, in, a, in a musicology course I was taking at U of T, I asked if I could, um, we were asked to practice our paper presentations and I asked if I could uh, do a listening exercise in the paper presentation and the, and the prof responded um, with, um, well, this isn't a music education class. And I don't remember if I hold, held my tongue or not, but I, mem I remember wanting to say, you are teaching us, right? You were teaching, you know what I mean? Like I, I felt a bit, you know, like, um, and, and so I do, I am very concerned when folks don't think of post-secondary, like post-secondary music as music education. Like if we're transforming music education, I think that's the place to start actually. And if we, um, I don't know, maybe Dylan's getting annoyed with getting referenced a lot, but the letter he wrote to faculties and schools of music um, for one thing, talks about which bodies are getting into these faculties of music. And if you think about, then go back to thinking about elementary and secondary schools, who's becoming music teachers? I mean, we all know the answer, right? It's, it's, it's time is up, right? It can't, it's got to stop. Sorry to be so um, uh, upset about this, but time is up. Like that gatekeeping has to stop. So like I said, if we're going to like, ask people to bring their musical and listening practices, whether it's sound or musical practices, that means we have to be willing to actually shape our institutions, especially the gatekeeping ones, into um, around these practices and individual um, musical experiences of our students. I don't know, maybe I got away from the question because I got upset. 
Sorry, but time time's up. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. I appreciate that. Patricia, I wonder if you have something to add. Well, I, I think that um, I, I think that uh, the the idea of community engagement seems to be a growing uh, potential uh, seems to be something that is coming into place at the university level. Uh, it's a slow go in, in many places, but I, I do think that uh, it's rising. Uh, and that is to say, um, town gown uh, sorts of uh, uh, performances and even participatory musicking uh, encounters uh, seem to be on the rise. Uh, some years ago, and I did reference this, uh, uh, we put together a, a manifesto uh, for uh, changes to the undergraduate uh, um, music studies curriculum uh, across all specializations. Uh, and we, we came up with three principles that, that needed to change. Uh, and, and they were uh, um, uh, to re-enliven undergraduate four-year programs, uh, uh, whether it was performance or academic areas, music education. Uh, that, that we needed to, to grow in the way of creative uh, encounters, creativity needed to, to kind of settle in uh, to so many courses and applied lessons, ensembles and so forth. Diversity needed to happen. Now this was 2014. I think it is happening uh, sometimes superficially, but in diversity of, uh, of certainly uh, repertoire is growing. And, and the third matter was integration. And integration was to say that uh, um, academic courses uh, could turn performative, uh, that performative courses uh, could have uh, academic surrounds. Uh, you know, who makes this music? Why? Uh, what are some of the theoretical structures? So forth and so on. Analysis. Um, but that integration also proceeded to uh, the idea of. Uh, of allowing the doors of the university to open to uh, it, the integration of community music, uh, that is to say, uh, musical presences in, in, in the local realms uh, that could be brought into uh, uh, performance spaces, could be brought into uh, classroom uh, uh, encounters, uh, seminars, and so forth. So um, I, I think that, um, you know, again, that was, that was eight years ago that we put that manifesto together and it was very controversial. Uh, some folks saying, we already do this. <laughs> but I think many of us needed a reminder and, uh, and a taking to task. And there have been, uh, I think there've been some, some, some changes, uh, definitely uh, some disruption uh, to the system um, uh, and some reforming. So that gets at least to the university level. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, we have a question from Matthias Richard. Uh, it's a question for Doug. How do you think that critical listening sound pedagogies could respond to what Dylan and Michael Nardone were identifying as the inability of Schaefer to hear Indigenous people's voices and sounds? It's a good question. Deep one. Um. Thanks for that question, Matthias. Um, well, I guess, I guess, like I was saying, I feel like if, if I, I, one of the things that this is maybe a stretch, but one of the things that I keeps keep, keeps coming up is as as faculties and schools of music um, change, you know, shift their practices. Um, a lot of um, professors there don't feel comfortable with like not you know conducting an orchestra or like all of a sudden you have like you know you, as an example you might have folks that are doing computer music or DJs with, you know, and, and, and one of the things that keeps coming up is that professors don't feel comfortable doing that. And I, and I, this is, again, my own experience, but it feels like shape, like, as I said, in my presentation, Schaefer's listening and sound, like attention to just listening and sound did allow me to disrupt that, that circuit, you know, and that I didn't have to just conduct, I could ask students what they hear, what they, you know, not just musical, what sounds they hear in their daily life. And that we could center, we could create a program that centers that centers those. It's not always easy. I'm not trying to pretend like it's an easy thing. Um, so I guess m my hope, I know that's maybe a little far still from what the amazing stuff that Dylan and Michael are doing, um, but but my hope is that is that we'll kind of stop perpetuating, or we can maybe stop perpetuating this dominance that still seems to continue continue on of Western European music. And I think that Dylan Michael's work is is an essential, of course, I don't know, they don't need me to say this, but it's such an essential part because we have to illuminate the harm that's been happening. Illuminate, you know, 
and 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 eliminate together with our students the harm that has been going on being perpetuated. I don't know. Thanks for that question, Matthias. It's a tough one. <laughs> I, I do think though that there is but you know Schaefer did the thing he did in a particular way and from a particular time and and but there's a principle here that I think is what's always inspired me is the idea of heuristic education right the idea that the that we discover music and sound through through actioning it through encountering it through exploring it and and I and I think the work you're doing, Doug and and Patricia, is is linked to that principle very much, right? That 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 it's if we if we consider music education as facilitating that encounter instead of teaching techniques and strategies only um, and skills, then we get a, we we do get some way towards the. I think we could, with the right mindset, get somewhere towards fostering a critical listening positionality along the way, as, as Dylan's put it so well. And, and Matthias adds, maybe critical listening's awareness of power can be a way of structural listening to coloniality and all its manifestations and structures of society and institutions. Yeah, I think you're, you're spot on there, Matthias. Um, it, I'm, go ahead. Oh. It, it, it just seems too that um, music teachers who are the isolated single music teacher in in, in a K twelve setting uh, feels the the urge uh, the, the the incredible push the shove uh, to to make music uh, for for some event or another uh, and that by making music and and being a public presence. Uh, for their band, choir, or orchestra will continue the program. But I think there's also something to be said about music teachers who go horizontal, who think in an interdisciplinary way, who uh, collectivize with other subject specialists. And that again goes to, you know, um, science teachers, environmental science. It may also go to language arts and to social sciences. And so that, that part of the survival of music Maybe uh, the way in which a music teacher can take that music uh, from from sound awareness exercises to uh, creating something new and fresh, uh, which may be inspired uh, by by sounds of the local, um, as well as from uh, you know global um, perspectives. Uh, but 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 again, going horizontal uh, in order to create uh, or to further, I should say. Uh, uh, form and shape uh, the holistic development uh, of the child. Yeah, I just want to say right on, you know, <laughs> thank you both so much. This is a great session. Uh, we're going to take a, a, a seven minute break and return to start our next session uh, at 305.